Welcome to the series that takes you to the heart of America and reveals the inner workings of our country as you have never seen them before. I'm Yul Kwan. I've worked in many different fields, from law to government to business. I've even won the reality show Survivor. But in every part of my life, I've been fascinated by the same things, systems and networks. We're going to go on quite a journey, coast to coast, across this sprawling land to discover the habits, the rhythms, and the secrets that you only notice when you step back and see the big picture. The interchange is oddly elegant. In the next hour, aerial photography and satellite tracking will reveal how America's transportation systems make us the most mobile people on Earth. We've built vast networks of roads, rails, and airways. And an army of workers keeps the wheels turning. Hey, who here likes Mike the bus driver? <laughs> but it's getting harder and harder to keep all these systems running. Well, I think the freeways will get so slow where a lot of people have just decided it's not worth the grief. Many of them are aging, designed at a time when America was far less crowded. You have a disruption in one place and it ripples all the way across the country. It does have a ripple effect. But even as they struggle to keep up, every day our systems miraculously manage to get us where we need to go. This is a story of 310 million Americans on the move. This is America Revealed. America Revealed is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Monday morning, just before dawn. But this isn't the night sky. This is America. This is us. Each of these points of light represents 7,500 people. They create brilliant constellations that span the continent, from the faint glow of small towns to the blaze of cities like Chicago and New York. To connect these dots, we've built 4 million miles of roads, 200,000 miles of rails, 5,000 airports, the largest transportation network in history. But keeping it all moving? That's America's challenge in the 21st century. And nowhere does that challenge loom larger than in New York City. It's the perfect example of a powerful but aging transportation network that moves millions even while straining under their weight. Take the island of Manhattan, 23 square miles, home to 1.6 million people. Every weekday morning, its population nearly doubles, swelling with an army of commuters. These people are essential to the life of the city, but getting all of them onto this tiny island in only a few hours is a daily adventure that teeters on the edge of chaos. And it's about to begin. It's 6.13 a.m. I'm coming in on the red eye from L.A. to JFK International Airport, and I've got plenty of company. We plotted the paths of every plane landing at New York's three major airports in a 24-hour period. A flight comes and goes every 24 seconds. That's more than 3,500 flights a day. By 7 a.m., Thousands of yellow cabs are picking up their first fares of the day at the airports and heading for Manhattan. This 
taxi is one of 60,000 vehicles that will weave its way through New York's necklace of bridges and tunnels in the next hour. Just below these bridges, more than 100,000 people are traveling to and from the island by boat. These are the traces of those vessels darting around New York's rivers and harbor, including one fleet, which alone carries 65,000 commuters a day, the Staten Island Ferry. As thousands descend on the island by air, road, and water, even more arrive by rail. Long Island Railroad trains carry suburban commuters into Manhattan every two to four minutes, along with packed trains from New Jersey and Amtrak trains. They all converge at America's busiest commuter hub, New York's Penn Station. While only a few blocks away, trains from the north stream into another bustling train station, Grand Central Terminal. But getting people onto Manhattan is just half the battle. Now they have to deal with this. The streets run yellow with taxis, competing with thousands of trucks and cars. And bus routes crisscross the island, adding another layer to the traffic. I'm not surprised the word gridlock originated here. It's 8 a.m and it looks like nobody's going anywhere. But beneath these streets, it's a different story. I'm talking about the subway. Every day, this system carries over five million passengers citywide. Without it, traffic would overwhelm Manhattan streets and the city couldn't function. But the subway has had an even bigger impact than that. Starting in the early 1900s, when the first track was laid. If you build a transportation system in America, whole cities and towns will spring up around it. The subway system is a prime example. It determined how New York City took shape and dictates the patterns of its inhabitants' lives. Look beneath this forest of midtown Manhattan skyscrapers. Multiple subway lines converge here, funneling in hardworking commuters from the city's outer boroughs, like Queens. This is a snapshot of what Queens looked like in 1917, when subway construction was just getting started. And here is what it looks like today, a busy, vibrant borough. The subway made Queens possible. But how? 100 years ago, to combat overcrowding in lower Manhattan tenements, New York expanded its fledgling subway system into the sparsely populated outer boroughs. Critics call them the tracks to nowhere. But New Yorkers soon got on board, lured by the promise of open land just a short ride from their jobs. By the 1920s, these lines were carrying more passengers than they could handle. The city planned to add over 100 miles of new track, but first, the Depression hit. Then, World War II. Today, we're stuck with the same basic rails that were out of date in the 1930s, and the number of passengers keeps going up with every passing decade. It's a pattern we'll see all over the country, enormous but aging systems working harder and harder to keep up with the growth they help create. It's 10 a.m. and the morning commute is winding down. The city has survived another rush hour and millions have made it to their destinations. New York's public transit system may be old and crowded, but without it, this teeming metropolis would come to a screeching halt. The same is true across the country. Our public transportation systems are what keep the nation moving. 
There's one system that carries a whopping 26 million Americans every day, more than any other form of public transport. There it is. There it is again. The humble school bus. What's up, guys? Good morning. I've come to Kingman, Arizona, to meet a guy who keeps one of these yellow marvels moving. Here, rush hour is just beginning. For many students in this desert community, buses are the only way to get to school. Around the country, kids rely on a half million member army of transportation experts, the nation's school bus drivers. Hey, who here likes Mike the bus driver? <laughs> Sit down, guys. <laughs> when these kids are on their bus, they're my kids, you know, and that's, and I don't take that lightly. You have to be the mother, the father, the mediator, the nurse, the cool uncle. Mike, how many miles do you drive every day? On average, I'll do about 165 miles a day. And that's just you? That's just me. This is Mike's bus. It's just one of Kingman's 53 buses. We planted GPS devices on them and found that they drive one and a half million miles every year to every corner of the school district, an area the size of Delaware. That's repeated nationwide in thousands of school districts, large and small. There's no system quite like this anywhere in the world. Here in the U.S., if you can't get there on foot, you can get a ride to your local school, even if it's not that local. So you guys are, are really kind of like the lifeblood of the system, right? I mean, without you, these kids wouldn't even be able to get an education. Oh, no, they wouldn't be able to get to school. No, we keep pumping the kids in so they can get educated. Our school buses work amazingly well, which is good considering how much we rely on them. But there are other transportation networks out there that face big challenges, including the system that first connected the country from coast to coast and made modern America possible. The railroads. To create a nationwide web of tracks, the federal government launched one of the most ambitious and expensive infrastructure projects in human history. And for nearly a hundred years, America's railways were the fastest and most popular way to travel. But not anymore. To get a glimpse of what keeps our trains going and what slows them down, I've come to the rail hub of the United States. Chicago. More trains passed through this city than any other. Because in the 1800s, Chicago's politicians lobbied to make sure all national rail lines end here. All tickets, please. Thank you. That created jobs, but also logistical nightmares. Today, there are three different systems here with different needs, all fighting for space on one set of tracks. Commuter trains making local pickups. Amtrak trains traveling longer distances with fewer stops. But those two passenger networks are dominated by the biggest and slowest network of all. Freight. Our economy depends on goods carried by rail from coast to coast. We have the world's most efficient and profitable freight system, moving nearly 10 times as much as Europe. It's so successful that freight companies own most of America's tracks. And many of our freight trains pass through one small section 
of Chicago's freight yards. The 27 miles of track behind me will move about 1.75 million freight cars each year. But this phenomenal success has come at a price. The system isn't nearly as good at moving something else. People. So what is it about the freight system that gets in our way? 533 East Yard, looking for the rehome. This is Jack Streck. He's using a remote control to push that train up a man-made hill they call the Double Hump. Shipping companies built this hill so that men like Jack can process all the freight coming through this yard and reassemble cars according to destination. The network we depend on to ship our goods depends on Jack, his remote control, and a surprisingly simple process known as humping. Humping is, is actually a, a, a slang word for classifying the cars. So yeah. Sorting, yeah. kind of like a postal facility. Uh, but instead of sorting mail, you're sorting these 100-ton uh, freight cars. Exactly. After Jack pushes the cars up the hill, there it goes. he separates them by hand, a century-old technique called pin-pulling. This board up here gives me a signal, shows me where to make the cut. And then, Jack lets gravity drag each car down the other side of the hump to its outbound track. These cars carry chemicals bound for Virginia, lumber on the way to Michigan, sugar for a cookie factory in St. Louis. And they all have to wait their turn in line at the double hump. Everything that moves through America moves through these yards. Yeah, exactly. A lot of times you can tell how the economy is running out here just by what's coming through the yard itself. All across the country, people and freight have to share the same tracks. Seeing these mile-long, slow-moving freight trains heading out of Chicago to the long-distance rail network, I can understand why passenger travel suffers. In 2010, the federal government pledged $8 billion towards a potential solution. The construction of new and upgraded tracks for a speedier passenger rail system. But that's only 15% of the plan's $53 billion price tag. Even if all that funding comes through, most long distance travelers will probably still choose a different way to get from here to there. One that's newer and much faster. Flight 17 now arriving at gate nine. This is the scene at Houston's George Bush Intercontinental Airport. Air travel, more than any other mode of modern transportation, has bridged our continent and sped up our lives. And every year, more and more of us are taking to the skies. This is flight data for the 50,000 planes that will carry almost 2 million passengers today. It shows how our airways connect every corner of the country. From sleepy rural airstrips to major hubs like Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. Where on this day, a plane is taking off or landing every 34 seconds. That's nearly a million flights each year. This vast system has created a completely new way of life. The people flowing through these airports aren't just occasional passengers. They're a new breed of road warrior who often fly thousands of miles every week. One of those very frequent flyers is international insurance salesman, Dean Burry. Good morning, sir. How are you today? I'm doing fine. Any bags you to check in Oh, uh, no, I never check bags. Good morning. How are you? Good. Welcome aboard. Uh, thank you. A typical trip, Miami to Tampa, Tampa to Houston, Houston to Vegas, Vegas to Houston, Houston to Dallas, Dallas to Tokyo, Tokyo to Hong Kong, Hong Kong to Macau. Thanks, boss. Macau to Shanghai, Shanghai to Tokyo, Tokyo to LA, LA to Dallas, Dallas to Tampa, and that was 11 days. 
Dean spends a lot of time in the air so he can maintain face-to-face -face contact with his clients around the world. What are some of the inside secrets of the trade that people like you know that other people don't? Oh, gosh. I mean, there's so many of them. It's on every subject, you know, how you pack is a key one, you know, how you go through the security line. It's all about logistics for the most part, or all the tricks. And what do you do when something goes wrong? You want to, you know, anticipate it. It's starting to snow. I've looked at weather.com or whatever. So you start making backup reservations. Sometimes I'll have two or three reservations at a time. You have to be offensive versus defensive. That's the secret of a real road warrior. It's not just road warriors like Dean zigzagging through our skies. Air travel is so common today that our airways are filled with all kinds of travelers. Some of them more unusual than others. Here are three regular passenger flights. But one passenger on each flight is traveling in cargo, brought aboard in a special box called an air tray. Baggage compartments of commercial airlines are the most common way to ship dead bodies long distances. Every day, 50 are shipped from one state alone, Florida. It's a retirement mecca, but when those golden years come to an end, many deceased retirees are flown home for burial. These passengers, on the other hand, are very much alive but they're under armed guard and they wear handcuffs as well as seat belts. They're traveling courtesy of the Justice Department, which runs its own airline flying prisoners to distant court hearings or penitentiaries and deporting some illegal aliens out of the country. With so many people flying for one reason or another, our skies are the busiest in the world but they weren't always so crowded. I'm heading to McDonald Pass in Montana to visit a relic of our earliest days of flight. Transportation-wise, this place is definitely off the grid. That was fun. <laughs> I feel like I'm standing on top of the world. We pretty much are. We're on top of the Continental Divide. They call Montana Big Sky Country, and it does look pretty empty up here. But this 90-foot tower holds a clue to how we learn to navigate our crowded skies. Mike Rogan is with the Montana Department of Transportation Aeronautics Division. So, I mean, what do these things basically do? They, they give you a visual uh, reference when you're flying at night. So these literally are kind of like lighthouses in the sky. Yes. The story of this air beacon dates back to the birth of commercial air travel in the 1920s. Aviation companies were eager to fly cross country, but they had no way to navigate the night portion of the 30 hour trip. So they invented one, paying farmers to light bonfires in their fields creating a path of flames to guide pilots through the night. They soon replaced the bonfires with a network of 1,500 gas beacons. 220, you're coming in nicely. You're 25 feet, too low, pull her up a wee bit. By the 1960s, modern radar was replacing the gas beacons, except in Montana, where the peaks of the Rockies block radar signals leaving pilots to rely on the old beacons so they wouldn't crash into the mountains. To this day, Mike continues to tend the beacons and make sure they're in good working order. That's a heck of a climb. That's a long one, isn't it? So this is what the pilots actually see. This lamp is focused in the middle of this 24-inch mirror. Uh -huh. And as it's turning around, you get a sharp flash as you're you're approaching the beacon. When you see the beacon, it looks like it's flashing. That's because it's turning around. You're only getting it for a second. Even though every other state has long since abandoned the beacons, we still live with their legacy. Many of the first radar towers were built along this network of gas beacons, which means that if you take a commercial flight today, 
and fly along one of the early skyways, your path will look like a zigzag that traces a line that sprang up from bonfire to bonfire and then beacon to beacon. From bonfire to beacon to radar, we've made progress. But as our skies got busier, we needed a way to handle the traffic. Enter the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, which maintains our complex flight management system today. Here's how it works. Each airport's control tower guides each plane to takeoff. Then a regional control center keeps tabs on it until it reaches 10,000 feet, where the flight enters one of the 21 en route centers across the country. And watching over the entire system are the people in this state-of-the-art bunker in Northern Virginia. People like flight manager Deborah Griffith. Air Traffic Control System Command Center. This place is immense. Yes. I feel like uh, I'm in that movie War Games or something. <laughs> no, no. What are all those lights up on that screen right there? Those are flights. Those are the active flights in the system right now. Well, how many planes are we looking at? During the peak portion of the day, we're five to 6,000 flights active. It's Tuesday afternoon. Just an ordinary day for Deborah, who's sort of a traffic cop of the skies. Good morning, everybody. This is Deb Griffith with you for the 1215 Planning Telecon. We're going to start with New York. Seven the gusty winds. Good morning, New York. Good morning, thank you. We are on a 3 3 left. Every two hours, Deborah leads what could be the biggest conference call in the world. Thousands of passengers' lives are on the line. All right, let's go out west to uh, Southern California, Trenton. Can you give us uh, any more information? Yeah, San Diego uh, right now, just nobody's getting in with the RVRs and the low ceilings. Uh, so we have Every major airline, airport, shipping company, the Secret Service, NASA, and the military listen in for updates to the National Flight Plan. Looks like Cleveland, we're IFR, so we're going to add them in to terminal constraints for IFR ceilings and this. Okay, that'll conclude this telecom. We'll be back with you at 1415 Command Center South. Thank you. As soon as she hangs up, Deborah begins juggling this network's limited airspace to keep traffic flowing. Got up down San Francisco forecast. Actually put ceilings in there for a few hours this morning. All right, that's it. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. She reroutes planes around San Francisco's fog and grounds others so they won't get caught in a bottleneck caused by strong winds over New York. 31's at Kennedy. Right now the volume's down for the next four hours. We'll see how that rolls. So it's kind of like a, a butterfly effect, where you have a disruption in one place and it ripples all the way across the country. It does have a ripple effect, it does. Well, because New York has slowed down, it's gonna historically slow down the other markets around it because those, those airplanes go in and out of New York and go to Fort Worth and to Houston and to Memphis and to Chicago and to Cleveland. All these flights depend on Deborah's ability to manage America's airspace. She's good at it and the system works well most of the time. But the problem with this system is that it's based on radar, aging technology that requires air traffic controllers to leave large safety margins between each plane, which means fewer planes can take to the sky. With our airways nearing maximum capacity, the FAA needs a game changer. If the air beacons in Montana recall aviation's past, you can get a taste of our future by heading to an even more isolated part of the country. This is rush hour in Juneau, Alaska. Only 10% of this state is accessible by road, so up here, everyday commuting depends on pilots like Sam Wright. Wow, it's beautiful. This totally beats my own commute. Welcome to my office. <laughs> it may be beautiful, but over the past 20 years, one third of all commuter plane crashes in the United States happened in Alaska. And Sam flies these treacherous skies every day. Sam, what exactly is your job? My job is to take people and freight, mail, UPS, FedEx, from Juneau, which is the jet port, to all the smaller communities around Southeast Alaska. What are some of the more common and uncommon things that you've transported? Well, very, 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 very pregnant women. 
taking them to the hospital for delivery. Yeah, taking them to Juno for delivery. <laughs> That's the scariest thing to me. Knock on wood, I've made it every time. But wolves, we've carried wolves, we've carried bears. Carried a really pissed off wolverine this winter. <laughs> well, the wolverine was going to Minnesota or someplace to be bred. Uh -huh. And he didn't know that, so he was just <laughs> flat unhappy. So you really are sort of like the connective tissue that allows these outlying communities to interact on a daily basis with the rest of the world. That's true. We, we look at ourselves more like just a little air road system. And how hard is it to fly around here? Is it, is it challenging? Well, today's like a gorgeous day, yeah. right? You can see for 80 miles, 100 miles. Uh, there's some days we can only see two miles. In Alaska, as in Montana, rows of mountains block radar signals and the snow and fog can quickly roll in from the ocean, forcing pilots to fly blind among the glaciers. So pilots like Sam are using a new satellite-based GPS system, which, unlike radar, can reach every corner of their airspace. So basically, this shows you everything that's in your immediate vicinity, right? Absolutely. If you make a turn towards something higher than you, uh -huh. that will turn red. It will say, hey, this is red. This is not a good idea. In Alaska, the accident rate for planes that have been equipped with GPS has dropped by almost 50%. And this system that keeps Sam and his passengers safe is beginning to have a much wider impact. GPS is the backbone of a new FAA plan called NextGen, designed to completely overhaul air traffic control. Air Alaska was one of the first airlines to test this new technology. Their pilots, like Mike Adams, welcomed it. One of the most advantageous features about the Next Gen program is the ability now to navigate more directly. These blue symbols represent ground-based navigation aids that in prior times, we would have been flying a zigzag line between those uh, as we go from station to station. Now with GPS navigation, we can fly directly from waypoint to waypoint as you see here. And that allows us to shorten our route distance, create a more direct flight. And that in turn frees up airspace for other aircraft to occupy hence increasing capacity. The estimated cost for NextGen is high, as much as $160 billion. But it will allow the FAA to fly 1.3 billion passengers a year by 2031, twice as many as it can handle today. So far, I've been traveling mostly on planes and trains, all packed full of people. But most Americans prefer their personal space, so getting from A to B usually means one thing. Cars. That's definitely true in Dallas. Here, like most of the country, Americans take driving for granted. We turn the key and go. But while driving feels like individual choice, it's only possible because of our system of highways, which is one of the busiest and most sophisticated pieces of infrastructure in the world. And we have grown so dependent on the freedom and mobility of the open road, collectively driving three trillion miles every year, that today, the health of our country depends on the health of our highways. So specialists like traffic analyst Greg Jordan work behind the scenes to help improve the flow of traffic. Oh, look at that beauty. The interchange is oddly elegant. You know, it's kind of like some sort of geometric shapes. An aerial perspective will give you an insight that is sometimes very hard to get on the ground. He's right. From the sky, I can see where cars are bottlenecking and where they're moving along at a nice clip. Local transportation planners from New York to California value Greg's expertise. He provides data so they can see for themselves where they need to invest in roads, where they need to build new ones, or widen them, or increase highway patrol. And how are you actually getting that data? Well, it's, it's mainly time-lapse photography. 
Looking at the snapshots Greg has taken over time, what strikes me is not just the roads themselves, but the number of housing developments hugging the highways. This is a new development. This is in Louisville. It's right near the newly completed uh, State Highway 121. So these communities are only possible because of that freeway. The freeway is the lifeblood. People like to say, if you build it, they will come. And, and to a degree, that's true. Okay. You know, if you build it, that encourages people. This is what more and more of our country looks like today. A tapestry of suburban neighborhoods woven together by quiet streets and bordered by busy highways. When the federal government started building these interstate highways more than 50 years ago, they were intended to strengthen connections between far-flung cities, but they've ended up totally reshaping local communities. This is what the sleepy town of Arlington, Texas looked like in 1950. And this is what happened when Interstate 30 connected it to nearby Dallas and Fort Worth. Highways stretching north from Dallas lured people out to the cheap land and open space of Arlington and other suburbs like this one, Colleyville. And these suburbs gave birth to a whole new way of life. This is a suburban dream, the cul-de-sac. Big houses surrounded by green lawns on a street with no through traffic. But living here comes at a cost. To understand that cost, we used GPS to track the cars of everyone living on this tiny cul-de-sac for a week. Each color represents one of the five families. That pink car is Phil Thompson heading to work. There's Sabra Ewing driving her sons to school. Her husband Kip in the red car is on his way to the airport for a business trip. Our car culture is so common now that we forget how different it is from the rhythms of urban American life just a half century ago. Modern suburbs promote a landscape where most things are accessible only by car. So these suburban residents spend much of their time behind the wheel. They drive to get coffee. Thank you. To do their banking. To buy groceries. In fact, they drive 50% more than their parents did. I probably put on maybe 100 miles a day. Wow. Easily 25,000 or 30,000 miles a year. But basically the assumption is that if you're going to live in this neighborhood, you have to have a car. That's exactly right. The way they design Colleyville and, and our community is that since it's off the beaten path, you have to drive 10 or 15 minutes before you get to a major road. Mm -hmm. And all this driving means our families walk a whole lot less. Walking is definitely more recreational. I walk the dogs in the neighborhood <laughs> to the mailbox and back. Now, the other walking that I do is going to be from parking garages to appointments when I go to customer meetings between the rental car agency and, and the gates at the airports. Most of us don't mind all this driving, but there's a problem. As suburban life evolves and our daily destinations change, our road system can't adapt fast enough. Look at our five families. They rarely venture into the city of Dallas all week. Our highways were designed to get people from the suburbs to jobs and stores in the central business districts. But nowadays, most people live, work, and shop in the suburbs, and the smaller secondary roads are jammed. On top of that, since we built our highway system, the population has doubled, and the number of cars on the road has more than tripled. That means more people stuck in traffic on roads that weren't designed to get them where they want to go. At the end of the week, after collectively navigating over 600 miles of suburban thoroughfares, our families return to the cul-de-sac. There are the Johnsons, last ones in.
Meanwhile, a few miles away, road construction crews are just beginning their workday. In the Dallas-Fort Worth area, planners are trying to reduce congestion by building their way out of the problem. This place is home to more road construction than anywhere else in the country. But it won't be long before this freeway attracts more people, creating more traffic and driving demand for even more roads. It's kind of an infinite construction loop. So some places are taking a different approach. I'm heading to one of the nation's fastest growing cities and one of its most popular destinations, Las Vegas. Each year, this city of two million has to move a rotating cast of 36 million visitors through its streets. Today, the National Finals Rodeo is coming to town, which means extra traffic pushing already crowded streets to their limit. Instead of building new roads as they do in Dallas, Nevada's transportation specialists are using technology to make the most of the ones they have. We're taking it to a place that we call the fishbowl. Jacob Snow is one of Nevada's transportation experts. Wow, this is impressive. You know, it really looks like we got some real rocket science going on here, and we actually do. It's a very complex system of hardware and software that we can monitor everything that's going on at the major intersections and the major traffic points in the Las Vegas Valley. And are these active 24 hours a day? It's a 24-hour town. Right. We've, got to, we've got to monitor traffic 24 hours a day. For all this rocket science, their most powerful tool is a device we often take for granted, the old reliable traffic light. We're doing something that most other places in this country haven't tried, and that's adaptive traffic signal control. If we get a lot of traffic on one particular direction or in one particular corridor, we need to make changes on the fly so we can distribute the traffic more efficiently. It's really a big brother type approach. Hundreds of cameras feed real-time traffic data to the fishbowl, where staff can adjust 1,250 traffic signals to keep the roads moving. So you're not adding capacity by building new roads. You're just making the existing system smarter. That's correct. We can get about 20% additional capacity by implementing systems like this. And for one one hundredth of the cost of a freeway or a roadway expansion. And it's not only cameras monitoring the action. As a Saturday night rush hour begins, I'm heading out to the field with one of Nevada's road managers, Chuck Leland, to see how he solves problems on the front lines. We do have some traffic backed up over there. Tens of thousands of rodeo fans are on their way to the stadium. That's the rodeo. Okay. It's zoo time. To get all those cowboys and cowgirls to the stadium, Chuck needs to make sure that each one of the city's busy intersections gets just the right amount of what he calls green time. I am a little concerned about Swenson. Why? That's a pretty long line of traffic out there. So, so what are you going to do about that? OK, what we're seeing is a lot of empty roadway out here. Uh -huh. We're going to steal a little green time okay. from the crews we're going to try and give it over here. That, that's a really interesting way to think about it. I, I never thought of traffic that way, but you're actually thinking of green time as like a scarce resource, a finite resource, and you're trying to allocate it in the most efficient way possible. That's exactly what we do. Hey, Kevin. Uh, Chuck. What we need is at Paradise. Chuck calls a fishbowl to order up a new light pattern. Southbound on Paradise. Let's uh, try and hold that one green as long as we can. OK, got it. I'll be downloading it in just a second. There's just no way you can get everybody green. Uh, it's not going to happen. So the best we can do is if you do have to stop here, I want to get you as many lights down the street as I can before I have to stop you again. Light by light, intersection by intersection, Chuck stays one step ahead of gridlock and gets everyone to the rodeo. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to ride in the City of Lights and Cowboys. Ouch. Ouch. Whoop it up a little with him. Come on. The party's over, and I'm leaving Las Vegas. And whom do I see at the airport but that veteran road warrior, Dean Burry? Hey, Yule. What are you doing here? Passing through. What are you doing here? I'm flying back home. I'm going to Houston. I got a flight in about half an hour. All right. Well, okay. <laughs> Good luck. Dean, like most of us, depends on a transportation system that's being pushed to its limits. And those limits are put to the test every day on the streets of my last stop. Los Angeles. When it comes to our transportation triumphs and failures, it's the ultimate example. LA has more cars than any other county in America, 12 million of them. It's a vast fleet that can move us to every corner of the county. It's also 12 million reasons why we might not get there on time. Unlike Las Vegas, LA doesn't have roads smart enough to move all this traffic. And unlike Dallas, there's no room here to build new freeways. It's one more system limited by plans made in another era. A hundred years ago, most people in Los Angeles traveled by streetcar, and they had the largest urban rail network in the world. Then in the 1940s, the city abandoned streetcars and began an unprecedented freeway building frenzy. This set of aerial surveys shows how freeways were designed to cut through neighborhoods. That prompted activists to fight back and block construction of new roads. As a result, LA was left with the worst of both worlds, devastated neighborhoods and an incomplete freeway system. This original freeway plan promised an additional 1,500 miles of road. And here's what was actually built, just 918 extra miles. And the city has had to deal with that shortfall. Every driver in LA experiences 64 hours of delays on average every year. Nearly three entire days spent stuck in traffic. miles per hour, which is certainly better than what we're looking at down below us <laughs> on the I-5 freeway, where they're inching along at probably three miles per hour. Right. Hey, listen, let me just take a break here. I've got a report coming up on the station. Well, once again, we wanted to tell you about that singular up in the 210. Commander Chuck Street is a city's last radio traffic reporter who still pilots a helicopter to hunt down bottlenecks. And so far, the eastbound 210 freeway is backed up to the 118. You know, I've been up here doing a traffic watch over Los Angeles for 27 years. You Have can, you seen a lot of changes in traffic? Uh, of course, the uh, traffic is worse, a lot more volume. Rush hour starts earlier, lasts longer. It starts out at some of the freeways coming in from the east at 5 a.m. Wow. And it probably uh, goes until about 8 p.m. So calling it rush hour is sort of a misnomer. It's more like rush day. Yeah, even the word rush I don't think is appropriate. <laughs> For some reason here in Southern California, uh, commuters are really independent souls. Uh -huh. And they, they really like having that freedom. But also, I think that an automobile is kind of a statement about them and who they are, at least who they think they are. It, right. It's part of their identity, really. What do you think is going to happen over time? Well, I think the freeways will get so slow where uh, a lot of people just decide it's not worth the grief and the stress. So hopefully they will start embracing mass transit. A revival of its mass transit system might be LA's best hope to keep the city moving. So the city is now investing in a dozen projects like this one. You're looking at an old streetcar route that was paved over years ago. And now it's being reclaimed for a new light rail line. Infrastructure's cycle of life. 
But these projects are big and expensive. And it's hard to imagine the people of Los Angeles giving up their deep-rooted car culture. LA's endless tangle of roads and freeways, another system at the breaking point. Like many other transportation networks, there are plenty of ideas on how to fix this. But the question is, will we? At every stage of our history, we have answered the challenge of how to connect a country and move a nation. Today, we're at another crossroads. Technology offers new solutions, but to improve our system, we'll need to invest a lot of money and change old habits. Wow. This week, as a nation, we'll drive 60 billion miles. Traffic will make 3 million of us late for work. 22,000 freight cars will pass through the double hump on their way to every corner of the country. Though they'll only average 10 miles per hour. Dean Burry will earn another 5,000 frequent flyer miles. And he'll have a lot of company in the air. One quarter of all the flights in the world will take off or land in the United States. And in the process, airlines will lose 45,000 pieces of luggage. The largest transportation network on Earth has its weak spots. And it's definitely showing its age. But we've managed to keep it up and running. And for the most part, it still gets us where we want to go. As for me, my journey across the country is about to end right where it started. I'm heading back to New York on the red eye. Just one more American on the move. America Revealed is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.